Do yeah. you think that this is more than just uh, a bit of anxiety? Do you think that there is no COVID phobia in the same way that we have claustrophobia, you know, and, you know, it, the fear of heights, mm. fear of spiders, mm. where people now have an uncontrollable fear response around yeah. the COVID pandemic? Is that is that about yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, I, I would completely agree with that. Um, and certainly, you know, from from observations, if, if, you know, just every human being can go out and just see people within um, their own vicinity who, who are still, you know, extremely um, frightened, extremely cautious about approaching other people, you know, within the UK, even though, you know, prior to the pandemic, we, we weren't really a face mask wearing society. You know, when you when you hear in, you know, sort of the ramping up of, of news around, oh, you know, we've got a new COVID variant or, you know, this is happening, that's happening. You can see that actually there's an uptick in people who are wearing face masks. And what's really interesting is they're not medical face masks, um, which actually protect them. They're, they're still, you know, they're, they're pretty bog standard face masks, which it, it doesn't offer that great amount of protection for that wearer. Um, and it's just, you know... It, to me, it's just like that reassurance that they have got some level of, of protection, whether it, it works or not. And, you know, uh, the, the, the point being with all of it is that if people cast their mind back to the messaging that happened, um, certainly from March 2020 prior to, to March, you know, it, the messaging wasn't as on point as it was in some other European countries, you know, in terms of ramping up the, the fear. But if you look at the messaging and, you know, I certainly um, did a lot of um, email writing to various government offices like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is very damaging to human beings. Um, you know, particularly when some of what the messaging that was going out wasn't it wasn't true you know it, it didn't work like that and um you know when we have that amount of messaging and that amount of pro it was propaganda you know because that's what it was trying to influence people to behave a certain way so you know that propaganda when you have that and then nothing to counter that then you know people are going to continue in in that in that vein and you know there there is a lot of um people and i often um you know from a qualitative perspective, you know, for me, it's really interesting to look at some of the messaging still going on in mainstream and look at how people react to that. And certainly, um, you know, in some, com well, quite the majority of comments were people who are, who are sort of replying, you know, they are still extremely frightened about anything to do with COVID, you know, really, really frightened. And, and almost, you know, it's like, um, a, a victim mentality of how can people not understand why we are still so scared you know and it's literally pitting themselves against others it's like you're either you know a covid vigilance and, and you're doing the right thing they still think that they're doing the right thing they're being good they're protecting everybody else and everybody who's not is a covid year mm -hmm. so you, you've got two camps there we, we, you know, so the, the the messaging and the narrative is is really divisive there. But people think they're in the right, and they think that people who are not like them are in the wrong. And this is this is really critical because, as as I was saying, I was just recently talking about say long COVID, and what I realized when I pull back from it. And so I have to be careful how I say this. So please moderate what I say and try and help me to get it in the right mm -hmm. way. But it seems that, as I observe, the people who are afraid of COVID and afraid of long COVID are the ones who are pushing for masking, universal masking, vaccine mandates, and more lockdowns, okay? And on the other side, you have another cohort of people who don't even believe a virus exists think that it was complete propaganda and there is absolutely nothing to worry about and you it's almost as if they are these groups are so far apart there doesn't seem to be a way to pull them together i think the important thing to remember from from both perspectives like both groups they're both um run by fear so you you know as equally as as one side is is scared of the virus, scared of what can happen. The other side is scared of 
what the potential of thinking about the virus, what, what it did to society and how it affected them. So fear is a, a pretty common denominator. And, you know, from, from you know, my perspective of really wanting to, to bring people together, it's having that empathy and understanding that, that both sides equally are scared of something happening. You know, and one of the problem that arises as well is that, um, and this goes back to, do you remember, the science, <laughs> the science. One of the problems is, is that myself as a scientist and yourself as a physician, we know because we've worked in this arena, know that there is no such thing as the science, no such thing. There are, and that's why I love science so much. <laughs> that's why I love it. Because, you know, there's lots of different opinions, lots of different perspectives that you can conduct an experiment in, in, you know, and try and replicate it and have completely different findings because there's nothing as variable as human beings, you know. And I think because for, probably for the first time, you know, in our generation, really, the science was front and foremost and, and everybody was sort of um brainwashed again in this idea of we are following the science which they weren't they were following a group's version of the science and so you've got these groups now where that's their science that's their science and there's only one science so i think you know if we could really work on actually uh, and we should this is never going to happen in mainstream media i'm sure it's not this thing and saying, you know, this is the beauty of science. This is how we progress. This is how we find things out because there's a consensus within science that there isn't just one dogma. That's a, you know, that's the beauty of science. It's not dogma. It's multifaceted. And, you know, I think that's part of the problem as well because of this whole notion of the science. So people I get to their science and hide behind it. There is something you said there that I really thought was fascinating that I wanted to capture. You said that there was fear on both sides. And then as I thought about it, so you have one side that has COVID phobia. Yeah. It's almost as if the other side has government mandate overreach phobia. Yeah. And they yeah. realize that if they even give them any slight opportunity they will do to them what they mm. did before which was extremely traumatic mm. and i i just remembered as i as you were saying it is that i saw somebody just say this and they said i am not afraid i am angry yeah how how do you square that circle right well as a neuroscientist um uh, yeah absolutely what underpins anger is actually fear because anger is um, an emotion to, to spur us into action to prevent something happening to us or when something has happened to us to actually counter the action and, and make it so that that can't happen to us again. So I could play, play and, and to, to your viewers who are watching this and saying, I'm not afraid, I'm, like, I'm really angry, honestly. I'm so angry that at times I fear for my own health. And I was like, I speak to many people and, you know, and I speak to, to my close family and I just, I don't know if I'm ever going to get over this psyop, the, the huge psychology that the approach and, and so much so is that, you know, part of the, you know, my, my, um, my PhD research was cognitive neuroscience for sure, but I always identified myself very much with a psychology you know, wanted to help people with their minds because of how my peers within psychology behaved during 2020. I can't even associate myself with the psychology. So I reneged my uh, membership with the British Psychology Society. That's how strongly I felt about what was happening to human beings. And so and it, it raises a question then. So how then do you explain? Now you pull back. And imagine you're now in the future, kind of yeah. like how we could look back at World War II and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you explain how the people who would, in theory, build the psych ops got trapped by the psych ops? Because it was exceptionally good and very, very well coordinated. I think mm -hmm. that's the thing that I found very mm -hmm. strange is that 
I mean, I was looking at it from the science point of view. I wasn't looking at it from that perspective, but I couldn't mm. understand why it was everybody was following the same narrative. I think nobody is stepping out except Sweden. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, you yeah. can see what happened to them. So yeah. how do you explain from a neuropsychology point of view mm. that yeah. this could have happened at this time? We thought we were beyond this. Well, I think that I think, you know, going back to what I was sort of um, saying before about even pre pandemic had noticed that there was been a significant um, shift in in sort of how the population, their thinking processes, the cognitive processes, people were definitely thinking less. And I think sometimes we have to consider like, you know, when I'm sort of researching and dealing with anxiety or panic attacks or anything that is around fear, I always sort of urge the person when, when we're actually reflecting on things to what happened just before that, because that's the critical process there. What happened just before sets up the perfect environment for, for that to happen. And I think once you look at, you know, sort of that, I don't know whether there was complacency, you know, there was, I think, you know, when you when the, sort of the psychologists, the nudge unit themselves were surprised at how compliant people were. But you have to remember that from 2001, since since 9-11, the fear agenda has been ramping up because they needed to have more money to spend on defense for all these wars. So we need to have an enemy. We need to have, you know, some some common aim that we're all, you know, this is why we need to do this. This is why we need to do that. So fear was around in the environment a lot. And when you look at, you know, programming, films, movies, you know, you you look and from that perspective, because, you know, I, I look at the environment all the time. From that perspective, you can see that, that people um, had been sort of manipulated and influenced through fear for quite some time. And the next thing it's like, you know, this is, this is a health disaster. You know, this it could happen to anybody, even you. Whereas any kind of um, health campaign before was targeted at certain groups that you were only in danger of this if you were. Now, for the, for the first time in, in a very long, it was everybody. You know, nobody was safe. When in fact they knew that some people, you know, were likely to get you know mild symptoms, weren't likely to be you know laid out with with you know really debilitating um issues they knew that right from the beginning but in this case it was everybody could get it everybody could be you know everybody could die from it and and they used quite a lot of um death scenarios and, and really quite shocking imagery and um you know just the fact that for the first time ever we, we found out people's price for being complicit, you know, was it £2,000 in furlough? <laughs> you know, £2,000 a month for furlough. And luckily the sun was shining in the UK. We had a, it was very hot. From the start of lockdown, it was sun shining. And something that you said, it, it sparked a memory for me. I remember a couple of days after lockdown had officially began and, and seeing that suddenly we had a whole host of TV advertisements, public announcements that were actually talking, you know, oh, let's care for each other, let's look out for each other. And I thought, God, have they, have they pulled this out of the, the, the hat? And at the time, I had a, a client who actually was a TV producer. I said to him, how long does it normally take <laughs> to do stuff like that? And he was like, it normally takes weeks. Yeah, it, they'd already had it in preparation. So it, it's like, you know, it's really interesting from, because... I'm sure you had the same. Yes, we are professionals, but we were also human beings who were going through the same experiences as other people. And I also had um, the added bonus of, um, you know, getting publicly vilified because according to the general public, I was not good enough. I was not keeping to the rules enough. I wasn't doing my thing. I, I remember where I lived at the time that one of the community groups tried having a one-way system around a river, out walking path around the river. And I happened to sort of write and just say, that's that's not okay. That's actually going a step too far. Do you understand how viruses work? Do you understand what's going on here? And I was literally, if they could have lynched me and, and, and burnt me at the stake, they would have done. And I'm like, you know, so it, it was very interesting, both from a professional and a personal point of view, exactly what was going on there.